Devin White's future with the team is still uncertain, but we tell you how things are going to shake out. That and more on today's episode of Locked On Bucks. You are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to the Locked On Bucks podcast. This Tuesday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of the day, every day. And don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow us on Twitter. I am James Yarko at jyarko underscore bucks. He is David Harrison at dharrison82, your host of Locked On Bucks, credential media members, uh, covering your beloved Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I am also the deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com, and David is a staff writer over at BucksGameDay.com, Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation, covering the Bucks. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, we want to show our appreciation for your continued support of this show. And on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, the Buccaneers and Saints are taking their love-hate relationship to a brand new arena, and NFL League meetings are currently going on in Minnesota with two resolutions passing on Monday that can impact the way you watch Bucks football this season. But first, James, the continuing saga between linebacker Devin White and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers has a new voice involved after ESPN's Brian Barnwell weighed in on the matter saying white is eligible for a contract extension and has an impressive resume but he plays a position the league doesn't typically value at a high level he's coming off of a disappointing season and the tampa bay buccaneers are in dire cap straits after the Tam- tampa the tom brady era this is the exact recipe for a frustrated negotiation and a trade request which is what happened just before the draft End quote. Now, James, that's just the first part of this uh, Brian Barnwell, who I continuously want to call Bill Barnwell, quote, that we're going to talk to or talk about from ESPN. But first and foremost, just stemming from this quote alone, do you believe, so basically, you know, Barnwell states that this is kind of the recipe for a frustrated player for a trade request if contract demands can't be met. And I understand that, but seeing what the Buccaneers have been doing, being a part of the team while all these contracts and void years have been getting agreed to, seeing kind of how this was setting up the future as a player on the team, and then also, by the way, benefiting from it by having a very good crew around you to help you uh, perform getting a Super Bowl ring. Do you think Devin expected too much from the Buccaneers wanting to be paid on an extension this offseason before this season, given everything that, again, he's been there to know what the Buccaneers have been doing for this team? Absolutely not. And, you know, this is a pro get your bag podcast. We've said it for a very long time about these players. Um, It's the exact reason players hate playing on the franchise tag. There's no long term security. So if Devin White goes out there in week one against the Minnesota Vikings and gets his ACL, MCL, PCL shredded into, you know, beef jerky, um, there's there's no security and he just lost out on a ton of money. We we saw something somewhat similar with Chris Godwin. He was playing on the franchise tag, got his ACL torn, and and that probably affected what he was able to get. Now I think the Buccaneers still paid him pretty well, um, but they want that long term security. So with that one year left, it's when a lot of players start to have their agents talk to the team or they talk to the team. They say, look, I want to get this deal done. So, I mean, no, I I believe Devin White was 100% justified in asking for this to get done. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. And I think I've seen, you know, there's been, there have been some fans who kind of said, you, they spent all this money. They did all these void years to make sure they keep everybody, bring everybody back for another run of the Super Bowl, do all these things. And yeah, that's great. You know what I mean? That is, that is absolutely wonderful. But to me, that does not disqualify Devin White from being a player trying to secure his own future just like every other player in the National Football League does. And then, you know, I don't think it goes as far as to say, like, that's a you problem, not a me problem. But again, like, I don't think that Devin White should be put in a position as a person living this profession to say, oh, well, you strapped your bank account really, really hard trying to get us multiple Super Bowls. Okay, guys, I'll just go ahead and take the risk and not have a safety net. Because, again, 
at the end of this thing, like I said, if, if Devin White goes out there and does get injured, a la Quan Alexander, is the team going to say, well, Devin, you know, if we weren't in this cap situation we were in last year, we would have paid you this much. So let's go ahead and pay you that much anyway, because we appreciate your sacrifice. No, they're not going to say that. They're not going to do that. They're going to lowball the heck out of them, just like it happens uh, year in, year out when you see this kind of situation. So I agree with you. I don't think that Devin White was out of line uh, at all wanting to get paid without having to play on this last year without any security net below him. I do think he crossed the line with all the social media stuff and all that stuff, but we've already kind of talked about that. Going back to Barnwell uh, and his comments on ESPN, he continued by saying, quote, the franchise tag for linebackers includes some edge rushers and is projected to come in at more than $20 million for 2024, which would be more than any off-ball linebacker in football is getting. I'm not sure White would get that much in terms of year one salary on the open market, and the Bucs might not be in position to offer that much on a franchise tag. The most likely scenario is that the two sides will come together and find common ground on a new deal, especially if White plays well early in 2023. If the Buccaneers collapse and think White's going to leave in free agency, though, he could end up being offered for trades before the midseason deadline, end quote. So a lot of a lot of thought, a lot of opinion uh, packed into that quote there from Barnwell and let's just set the stage here real quick James highest paid inside linebackers annual average value currently speaking Roquan Smith for the Baltimore Ravens 20 million dollars a year Shaquille Leonard Indianapolis Colts 19.7 million dollars a year Fred Fred Warner for the San Francisco 49ers 19.045 million dollars per year so yeah a 20 plus million dollar franchise tag certainly more than any other off-ball linebacker uh, is currently making currently right now as it stands the Buccaneers are scheduled to have 10.468 10.468 million dollars in cap space. Mike Evans is in a contract year. Lamonte David is in a contract year. Antoine Winfield Jr. is in a contract year. And you need about eight to ten million dollars, depending on where you're drafting, to sign your draft class every single year. So essentially, James, the Buccaneers have functionally about half a million dollars in cap space. Mike Evans, Levante David, Antoine Winfield Jr., and Devin White, all in expiring contracts. Do the Buccaneers have enough flexibility to warrant possibly franchise tagging Devin White? Yes, absolutely, because there are plenty of restructures and and contracts that can be done in a way that it's going to free up the money. We see it all the time. We see all these restructures. I think it was, you know, you've mentioned it a couple of times. The Buccaneers could still basically snap their fingers and free up about 20 to 30 million dollars in cap space right now. So, yeah, they have the flexibility if they want it, Um, whether or not they go down that road. Uh, remains to be seen. Obviously, you want to see Mike Evans back. Obviously, Antoine Winfield Jr. is going to be a high priority. That also means that it will be Tristan Wirth's contract year. Uh, So you're going to want to get that deal done. On top of that, you know, if Baker balls out, well, he's a free agent. It's only a one-year deal. You're going to want to bring him back, and it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more than it's costing you this season. So there's a lot of things that they're going to have to do. That they're going to have to finagle. But again, it's Fugazi. It's Fugazi. It's it's whatever the Bucks want it to be because they can manipulate it in any way they want to. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you on this, but not from a functional standpoint. Like, could the Buccaneers franchise Devin White? They absolutely could. But here's the problem: if you franchise Devin White, then I think you put yourself in a position where you're not bringing back Mike Evans, or you're not bringing back Antoine Winfield Jr. And if you're franchising Devin White, then the only reason to really kind of like grab onto his ankle and say, no, no, Devin, don't leave us. Don't go anywhere. It's because you think you have a successful thing moving forward, right? There's, there's no reason to dedicate that much cap space, which means you're going to want to keep Mike Evans. You're want to get, you're going to want to keep Antoine Field Jr. You're probably also going to want to keep your quarterback. (laughs) If you're not going to keep your quarterback, then you're at least going to go look for a quarterback to drive this thing. You're not talking about a top end draft pick. You're talking about a veteran and you don't want to get stuck in a situation where you're paying a guy like Carson Wentz $28 million to play for you for one year. Believe me, I've seen it. It doesn't work. It doesn't look pretty. So you don't want to do that. So I just think that if we're in a scenario where the Tampa Bay Buccaneers want to franchise Devin White, I don't think you're doing that saying, okay, we're now also letting all these pieces walk away, but we're going to keep hold of Devin White. The the two just don't seem to to blend in my mind. Now, again, we're playing the big what if game. A lot of things uh, can go down, but here's the real part of this question, James. How does this thing turn out? What happens with Devin White and the Buccaneers at the end of the day? Uh, I, I'm going to cheat and I'm, I'm going to give you two answers because that's what I do. And you didn't tell me that I couldn't, um, if Devin white is getting a new deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it will come during the season. 
much the way we saw the V to V extension go down, kind of the way that that Jason Light has operated a little bit. That's kind of going to be the first domino to fall in order to set up the rest of the Buccaneers uh, pending offseason after the 2023 year. If a deal is not done in season for Devin White, I don't think he's back. And I think he walks in free agency and someone's going to give him a huge bag and congratulations and, and we're happy for you and thanks for the Super Bowl and you know all that stuff. But if the Bucs are going to retain him, that deal is going to have to be done prior to the conclusion of the 2023 season. Yeah, so I don't think the Buccaneers are going to sign him and re-extend him rather in season. Uh, and I don't think Devin White's coming back. To be quite honest, with you. I don't. I just don't. I don't. Again, if this season turns out really successful for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, that's great. But Baker Mayfield doesn't have the gravitas or gravita, however, however you pronounce that word, that Tom Brady does. Right? He doesn't have the. He doesn't inspire guys. Even after one good year, he's not going to inspire guys to take pay cuts to stay with the team. And to be quite honest, I mean, remember, go back to the NFL scouting combine. Devin White said, "I want to be a hundred million dollar linebacker." before he ever even joined an NFL franchise or roster, right? I don't know that Tom Brady being on the team would be enough for Devin White to sacrifice that goal of his. You know what I mean? I just I just think this is something that's kind of fixated in his mind, so I think he wants to chase that bag. And again, you look at the cap situation, you look at the other players. If you're going to pay an off-ball linebacker that much money if you're the Buccaneers, that means you've had a really good season, but it also means you want to keep these other players. Are you going to keep three players? Or are you going to keep one off-ball linebacker? I think the decision has to be a pretty easy one for the Buccaneers. So I don't think the Bucs are going to give him the money he wants. And that means he's going to go chase that money somewhere else with someone who potentially has a Super Bowl winning quarterback like a Josh Allen or a Jalen Hurts. I might be wrong. You might be right. And, and I'm sure that more Bucs fans would appreciate your resolution than my resolution. But that's how we see things going down right now. Speaking of resolutions, though, the NFL passed two of them on Monday during the spring league meetings in Minnesota, James. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Bucks is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. On Sunday, the Miami Heat decided they just could not let the Denver Nuggets be the only team to go up 3-0 in the conference finals. So they defeated the Boston Celtics and did it rather easily. I actually turned it off like midway through the third quarter. I was like, all right, this is, this is not happening. Fortunately for me, I saw their copycatting coming. So I made $12 off of their playoff plagiarism. That's what I'm calling it. And the Miami Heat are now minus 1,300 favorites to win the Eastern Conference Finals. But look, if you've got an extra $1,300 laying around, you could potentially make a hundred dollars as long as the Miami heat actually close this thing out. So if you bet $1,300 on the Miami heat to win the Eastern conference finals and they do, which again, no team has ever lost when they've been up three Oh in a conference finals or in the playoffs period, then you'll make a hundred dollars to be the easiest hundred dollars you've ever made. If the Boston Celtics win a game. If they win two games, you're probably going to be sweating that $1,300 so for a little bit. Look, I'm not going to do that, but maybe you have more guts than I do to tempt fate that badly. No matter what you want to bet on, no matter how you want to bet, there's no play, better place to bet on playoff action than at America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel official sports betting partner of the NBA. <laughs> Bring a lock on Bucks, your first listen or view of the day today and every day. Every day is make sure you come back tomorrow. I'm pretty sure Evan Klosky is going to be back to join James Jarko, who is back this week and better than ever. The NFL passed two new resolutions on Monday, which is not going to have, at least one of them is not going to have James believing that the NFL is better than ever. Something that passed on Monday is something that literally everybody was asking for unless you're actually everybody and the only people asking for this were people wearing suits at Amazon's headquarters and that is flex scheduling for Thursday night football uh, starting uh, this season James the NFL will now allow flex scheduling on Thursday night because they care so much about player safety but they care more about making Amazon happy. They want to keep that gajillion dollar deal. 
in place for Amazon Prime Thursday night football. And we all know Thursday night football is a joke and it was a joke last year. And they got all like the worst matchups uh, you could possibly get. So the NFL is basically now permitted to turn a Sunday afternoon game on your team schedule into a Thursday night game between weeks 13 and week 17. Now, the NFL does have to give those teams 28 days notice that their team will be playing not on Sunday, but on Thursday, and that's 28 days from the date of the game. So how does that work? Well, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, those possible matchups, Bucks versus Carolina, so at home against Carolina Panthers, currently scheduled for December 3rd, could be moved to a Thursday night game, but they would have to be told so no later than November 2nd. So you get a little bit of a ramp up. And the good news here, though, James, is there's still only a max of two Thursday night games possible for every team in the National Football League. So if you're looking at, like, say, I think the Dallas Cowboys, because they've got a Thursday, obviously, they've got a Thursday Thanksgiving game, and then I think they have another Thursday night game. So in theory, they can't be flexed out of one of their Sunday games, weeks 13 through 17 to play uh, another Thursday game. And again, that's only if they actually have two. Don't quote me on that because I don't cover the Cowboys, but that's just an example. So teams already can play up to two Thursday night games or Thursday games. They still can only play up to two Thursday games and they have to have the 28 day notification. But is that enough, James, to make you take back your uh, take back your Chewbacca impression? Or are you still very, very frustrated by this rule change? First off, my Chewbacca impression is much better than the noise that I made. That was a noise of sheer frustration <laughs> and anger. Frustration? Frustration? Because yep. that would be a Chewbacca. <laughs> anyway. That's actually, um, that's pretty good. I can't do that. That's pretty good. <laughs> the NFL is the worst. Because, I, and, and I'm not going to go on my full-blown Thursday night football soapbox because I've already done it on this show a couple of times. But... It's bad enough that you're forcing these teams to play Thursday nights all year long. You know, it used to be the novelty. It used to be Thanksgiving and then maybe an extra Thursday game here or there, which was usually something that had major playoff implications. Um, so it's bad enough that we're doing Thursdays every single week. It's a bad product. More often than not, regardless of the teams that are on the field, because there's no rest, there's no practice, there's no anything. It, it's it's garbage. It's a garbage football game. And now we're going to start flexing other games in there, which is a logistical nightmare. Not only, okay, yeah, you're giving these, these players 28 days notice. Fantastic. Super duper. These are players that, the team books the hotel. There is a private team charter. They are having no travel problems at all. David, in your situation, and yeah, I'm going to sound a little selfish right here because I'm on this side of it and not, not the franchise side of it. You have to plan out your travel arrangements to go cover, whether you're covering the Bucks or the Commanders. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you've got your flight booked. You've got your rental car reserved. You've got your hotel booked. You're ready to go. Oh, by the way, you got four weeks to change all of those arrangements because we just moved the commanders into Thursday night football. Have fun with your yeah. likely non-refundable deposits when you inevitably have to cancel those arrangements because we're the NFL and we bow to the whims of our broadcast partners and don't take into consideration anybody else, whether it's the media, whether it's the players and their health and their safety, uh, we don't care because we're just going to cash checks from Amazon and CBS and Fox and NBC and ESPN. Yeah, not a fan of the Thursday night games. Never have been, never will be. Um, I will say this, though. The fact that the NFL is making this kind of a change to, to the rules, um, it, it, it states two things. One, it states that Amazon was not fully happy with what they got in return for their investment last year. And uh, I'm just saying, like, when the NFL doesn't make money, they tend to get rid of things. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. The other part of this, uh, this is a huge flaw in the CBA. Like, if players aren't happy about this new rule, uh, that's a CBA problem because the NFLPA didn't have to approve this. The NFL just did it, and they just did it. And now players have to deal with it, and they have to do it. So, uh, again, we've talked about this several times over the years. Uh, CBA time. Like, guys, this is this is what your union should be worried about, not 
uh, whether or not you can wear the number zero, to be quite honest with you. James, we've got one more rule change that we need to get to, but that one took up a lot of time. So we're going to get to that on the other side of this very last break. So coming up, we will talk about an emergency player, an additional player suiting up for your Tampa Bay Buccaneers, potentially in the 2023 season. Coming up next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. <laughs> things up here on a Tuesday edition of the Locked On Box Podcast. And real quick, David, uh, I, I wanted to jump in at the beginning of segment two and, and couldn't. I think we could really, really put my betting woes to the test if I were to bet on both the Nuggets and the Heat to win. <laughs> Either we're going to have two of the most epic comebacks in NBA playoff history or uh, my bad luck streak will finally end. I think we should. I think if you bet a hundred dollars right now on the Nuggets to win the Western Conference Finals, you make like 77 cents. I think that's how bad the odds have gotten. I just want to just handle like, yeah, good, good try. We're not paying you that much. I'll just bet a dollar. Um, do it up, do it up. And, uh, bet a dollar, enjoy that seven cents. And real quick, a uh, big thank you to you for holding down the fort last week between my son's birthday and me being sick. Appreciate all the uh, the extra work that you put in. But David, we do have one more rule change that we need to discuss. And uh, that is so we don't have another situation like the 49ers ran into in the playoffs. And that is the activation of an inactive third quarterback. There was a lot of words there. We're going to break it down real quick. So teams still give their active and inactive player report 90 minutes before kickoff. But now they can dress an extra quarterback who would be inactive on the initial report, but could be activated if a situation arose that he was needed. So for Saints fans saying this is where you dress Taysom Hill, no, that's that's not how that works because he couldn't play unless both of your quarterbacks were ruled out for the game. If one of the first two is clear to return, the third quarterback has to be removed. And if a team dresses three quarterbacks on their active roster on game day, they do not get a fourth. And this can't be a player who was called up from the practice squad either, which is really the most interesting part of all of this because some teams like to roll with just two quarterbacks on the active roster and then stash one on the practice squad and call them up if needed. But with this rule, you need that guy on your active roster already. So yeah. that means that Kyle Trask will finally get to dress for a game instead of being inactive. Yeah. I mean, well, he could still be inactive. Well, no, Kyle Trask will be number two. But anyway, so yeah, yeah. so it's 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 just going to be interesting. I mean, look, week to week, this isn't going to come up very often, right? Like this isn't going to be a thing that really comes up a whole lot. But I, I do actually want to applaud the NFL for once for seeing a problem and even though it was really only a problem once, I mean, it was a big one time, right? NFC championship game. That's pretty stinking big. Um, but, you know, the problem was was brought up and they said, OK, let's let's do the common sense thing and let's do let's make a decision that just makes sense for everybody. To be quite honest with you, I don't really understand the process of like you have a 53 man roster and then on game day, you just got to make a decision like five or six guys got to sit like like what? What? Why? Like, just hey, give I, me 53 guys like, you know, right. like what does that really what does it really impact? Maybe a little bit of pocketbook. I don't know if there's a pay difference. I don't, I don't really know how all that works, but I don't know. To me, it's negligible, uh, if anything. But yeah, I like the rule. I like the change. I don't think you're going to see it actually need to be used all that often, which is also a good thing as well. But it is just to me, to me, the most interesting part of it is the fact that if you have that third emergency guy that you're not going to have active on game days, but you do want to have him as an emergency, he can't be a practice squad call up that week. He's got to be on your 53 man roster to start with. So that does adjust the manipulation of uh, regular season rosters just a little bit, but uh, unless that's honestly, that's only going to be interesting to huge roster nerds like me. Yeah. All right. Well, real quick, David, to wrap all of this up, uh, the Buccaneers continue to be a thorn in the side of the new Orleans saints. Uh, This time it is off the field, and uh, obviously the Buccaneers continue to be the superior organization in every conceivable way, and uh, they have filed a lawsuit against the New Orleans Saints for use of the word crew, and that's K-R-E-W-E, not C-R-E-W. According to Josh Gerben, who took to Twitter to discuss the trademark claim, the Buccaneers claim that they used the term crew first 
though the Saints have begun to call their cheerleaders the Saints cheer crew. Another way that the Saints are trying to be like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, or at least as cool and successful. The Buccaneers introduced the term crew over a decade ago to refer to their fan base. Gerben, who is a trademark attorney, outlined the Bucs' use of crew in their loyalty club membership, their marketing, their merchandise, and the promotions of the team. Now, the Saints' use comes as a tie to the city of New Orleans, where the term has been used since the 1800s, more specifically in reference to Mardi Gras. Now, there's certainly it's certainly going to be interesting to see how this shakes out and whether or not there will be a settlement outside of court or whether this will actually be pursued all the way. But David, doesn't matter that New Orleans has used crew to reference Mardi Gras since the 19th century. Doesn't matter that the city of Tampa and the Tampa Bay area has used it in reference to their Gasparilla uh festivals for for a long time buccaneers as a team used it all first so who's in the right here uh they're both stupid i don't care about who uses the word crew and who used it first unbelievable who use it historically it's it's like the 12th man thing like i i didn't care when the seahawks and Tex, texas a and m were going as a no we have the 12th man no we have you can both have the 12th man it's okay you can both be pretty and you can both be right. Like, it, like it's okay. Here's here's my thing. Are Bucks fans not going to go buy like a shirt that says like "Welcome to the Crew"? I don't know. Like, are, are Bucks fans are just going to like not no longer want to see the word "crew" because the Saints use it? No, like that's 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 not a thing. Are Saints are the Saints gaining something that would otherwise be the Buccaneers's by using the word? No, it's that's not a thing. So really, there's no impact here. And honestly. I wouldn't have even known about it if it wasn't for a stinking lawsuit. So, like, the lawsuit itself is the only thing even bringing this to my attention personally. Um, and from a fan-to-fan perspective, Buccaneers fans, just like you just did in the synopsis, are going to say, ha-ha, Saints, you're so lame, you have to copy everything that we do. Saints fans are going to say, ha-ha, Bucks, you're so lame, we didn't even know that you used it because we don't pay attention to you. And it's going to go back and forth, and it's going to be really fun on social media. And at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. So I don't care. I'm going to strongly disagree because it does. I know that's okay. That's okay. It does legitimately matter, especially when it comes to the, the profitability of the trademark. So someone has to win. Someone has to, well, yeah, someone has to win. Someone has to have the right to use this. If someone has to win, I think it's the Buccaneers because they've clearly used it first. They've used it in the NFL market and they've used it like as part of their marketing campaign. So to me, yeah, the Buccaneers should win. The Saints argument is going to be, well, you never trademarked it, and we beat you to the punch. Okay, and that's a technicality, but I think if we're talking about common sense, the Bucs clearly have been using this for a very long time, so it should stay uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't see how either of them using it takes away from the other side using it or making any money off of it. I guess we'll find out. I'm a little disappointed in, in David's. I know, but everybody's disappointed when I'm not just like this rabid, like, ah, oh, anything else in the NFC I mean, South is, is, makes me mad. It is what it is. It was one of the first thoughts legitimately that I had when the Bengals started using the phrase siege the day, but they spelled it D E Y uh, yeah. because of who day. And yeah. my first thought went to the Buccaneers failed, albeit ad campaign of uh, siege the day. Yeah, and so you know it's like okay if the buccaneers were still using that the Bengals would have had to strip away all that promotion all that merch all of those things because it very clearly is you know basically taking from something that's already already being used already being trademarked mm-hmm. um i just don't see i guess my 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 perception of it is the impact and it, and uh, you talk about the Bengals. there's the who day who dat Right. And that, I mean, not recently, but that one point, that was a point of contention between fan bases. And to be honest, like the Saints saying who that takes nothing away from the Bengals doing the who day and the Bengals saying who day takes nothing away from the Saints using who that. So I just, again, unless we get like a hundred comments on this episode from Bucks fans saying that they will not buy season tickets with the word crew on them. If the Saints have the trademark, uh, I don't, I don't, I just don't see the impact. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, both Who Day and Who Dat are extremely stupid chants. Uh, but agreed. Yes. But to be fair, 
who that came first. So if that went to court, I would actually That's back the Saints thing. and say, you know what? Yeah. They they did it first. They had it first. Um, please make Bengals fans stop doing it. And uh, just a friendly reminder that Ohio State tried to trademark the word the. All right. That the, is the first of all, they try to trademark the. And again, so that is stupid because <laughs> I don't care if you go the Michigan Wolverines, the Penn, like I'm a, I'm a born and bred Buckeye fan. If I hear you, an Illinois fan say, I bought a shirt that says the fighting Illini. I'm not going to go and say, take away all my Buckeye gear. I'm never buying another Buckeye thing again because the Illini did something that's stupid. To I, me. I to, okay. to me. And again, that's, that's just my opinion. I'm not even sitting here saying I'm right. I'm just saying that's how I see it. So if you disagree, that's fine. If anybody out there disagrees, that's fine too. Um, I just, I just don't see it that way. I appreciate your take on that because I've debated quite a few uh, Ohio State fans over well, that. Ohio State fans tend to be the worst, so I understand why you would have to debate that. They you really feel do. free to You're, clip that and share it anytime you want. I don't care. You, you are an exception to the rules, sir, and I want you to know that. And it's one of the reasons that I appreciate you so much except when it comes to Justin Fields. anyway we're not going to get into that debate we got to get out of here for this episode uh make sure everydayers and you know those who strive to be everydayers we believe in you come back tomorrow and hear evan klosky talk about all things buccaneers related and of course if you've got questions you can leave those in the YouTube comments, you can reach out to us at locked on bucks at G or locked on bucks podcast at gmail.com or slide in the DMs on Twitter at locked on bucks. We want to thank you for making locked on bucks your first listen or view every single day, for making us part of your day, part of your routine. And if you have anything else Tampa Bay Buccaneers related that you want to know, want to share, want to discuss, want to theorize, Make sure that you are following us on Twitter at JRCO underscore Bucks at D Harrison 82 and at Locked on Bucks. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. We thank you so much for joining us right here on Locked on Bucks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.